Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Jeff Holcomb and Bart Thompson about the run, hide, fight paradigm. Jeff Holcomb recently retired as a captain from the University of Florida Police Department, where he served for 30 years. He was in charge of the training, community outreach, and victim services divisions, and he has been with NCBRT since 2017. Chief Bart Thompson is the current chief of police at Louisiana State University. He's been with LSU for 11 years after 32 years with the Baton Rouge Police Department, and he's been with NCBRT for three years. Thank you to Jeff and Bart for coming on the podcast and sharing with us today. So to start us off today, can you tell us a little bit about what the run, hide, fight paradigm is? Surviving an active threat. Uh, run, hide, fight, uh, those three words should be kept in the back of your mind. Uh, even if you're ever involved in an active threat situation, uh, both mentally and physically, uh, prior to an incident increases your chances of survival. Uh, observe the warning signs, be prepared to act. Inaction is not helpful. Arrive to a decision uh, take action to mitigate or eliminate the threat. Uh, Bystanders intervention is critical in stopping or delaying the threat, but don't let others delay what you're deciding to do. And to kind of add in with uh, what Bart was saying is, you know, I look at his, the run, hide, fight paradigms. It's basically an easy to remember response protocol. I mean, that's your three options to do if you're ever facing an active threat situation. Uh, Much like years ago, we all heard the terms stop, drop, and roll for fire situations. And I think, unfortunately, that's what's become today's response to the active shooter. And years from now, when we're in front of groups and say, you know, what do you do in a fire? Stop, drop, and roll. That's the mantra people can, you know, immediately respond back to you with. I think we're going to see that in, in years forward as saying, you know, st- uh, run, hide, fight for our response to uh, the active threat. Uh, and, and again, it's very one of the most important points of this paradigm is that it's not linear. You know, much like stop, drop, and roll is, that's that's what their focus was in that order to where with run, hide, fight, it's not necessarily that situation. The best option might be to hide first, and in some cases, you might be required to fight first. So again, it's just run, hide, fight is response to the active threat, but not necessarily in that order. A lot of us are really familiar with the term lockdowns in schools and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how this paradigm is different from the lockdowns that we've heard of uh, prior to um, the prevalence of run, hide, fight? Well, I believe years ago, you know, we we had lockdowns. We weren't necessarily sure it was a man-made threat. Oftentimes we have, you know, lockdowns are securing in place due to weather-related uh, situations. And oftentimes that that was even t- where we're telling people get under desks, you know, because of, you know, if uh, there's damage to the windows and those kind of things offering additional protection uh, to where really now we're looking at with a lockdown related to an active threat situation is more of, you know, the lockdown would be the hide portion of the paradigm where, you know, our focus now is we want to hide with purpose. We're not just hiding or locking down. We want to be planning for what if that person is able to breach our secure area, what do we do next? Like Jeff said, uh, you know, lockdown, shelter in place, all started during the weather related issues. Uh, you knew in high school and elementary school, you knew what to do if, if you got a tornado warning. I think the big difference is the training what law enforcement has done over the past decade. Uh, used to be uh, when law enforcement would go to an active shooter situation or a threat within the building, uh, the uniform officers would secure that building and wait for the SRT or SWAT team, special response team, those individuals that are uh, equipped to make entry. Well, because of recent shootings and active threats, That has all changed. Uh, So as soon as law enforcement arrives, they will immediately go to the threat. So I I look at it as different of lockdown and the fact that law enforcement 
are doing things different now than they used to be. Can we talk a little bit about what situational awareness is and why it's so important when responding to a threat? Situational awareness is, is being aware of what is happening around you. Uh, why you recognize early signs of danger in order to prevent violence. Uh, situational awareness helps you recognize and react so the risk factor is minimized. Uh, it also plays a big part in your everyday life. Uh, your initial reaction is denial. Was that a gunshot? No, it must have been a car backfire. Stop, look, and assess and react. Yeah, and just to piggyback off what Bart was saying, you know, the critical part of situational awareness. And it's something that, you know, we don't want people to, you know, I, I like to use the term, you know, act like, you know, be like cats where if something makes noise, we jump and, you know, we, we respond, you know, maybe in a negative manner quickly. It's just paying attention as we're walking into a certain area. We're looking for, you know, what may be out of the normal. It's kind of understanding the baseline, which, you know, what, once again, it's just having an understanding of what should this place look like at this time. For example, from going into a convenience store as you're walking in, you know, we may be thinking we want to pick up milk, we want to pick up, you know, bread or something we forgot to get to the store earlier. But as we're walking into that store, we are we making our list in our head or are we focused on where is the uh, store clerk? Are they behind the counter where they should be? What's going on in the store? What's happening at the gas pumps behind us? It's just, you know, being aware of what's going on around you. So as Bart said, if something happens uh, to, to go where, you know, where we don't want it to go, we can respond as quickly as possible because we are paying attention. Much like, you know, we tell students on our campuses, you know, if you're out jogging, especially at night, you know, make sure we're not wearing headsets or at least if you've got earbuds, have one ear open where you can hear what's going on around you uh, and not focusing as much on that. So it's just being aware of what's going on around you at all times. Yeah, you know, what Jeff said, uh, Situational awareness law enforcement has been doing this uh, from the beginning of time. Uh, a uniform officer late at night will pull up to a convenience store. They don't immediately get out and walk straight in. They sit back and look, where's the clerk? Is there customers? Uh, is the building empty? So what Run High Fight is trying to do is get that situ situational awareness to civilians. They need to look and take time before reacting into a location. Why is prior planning such an important part of run, hide, fight? Well, yeah, I would say like Bart, you know, mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there are going to be three normal phases everybody progresses through. You know, first it's denial. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to admit or, or recognize that this actual threat, you know, we always hear, and it's a very rare case that you you will find yourself ever facing the active threat situation. While rare, it can happen. Uh, so we don't want to do is spend time in that denial phase. We want to get through that deliberation is the next step where, okay, now what do I do? How do I respond to this? Uh, and then finally, we make that decisive action. You know, we do something. And that's where the run, hide, fight, and pre-planning comes in where we know our three options are run, hide, fight based on where the threat is as far as location to us is the person right there where we may be straight to fighting. Uh, if we have the opportunity to run, we're going to do that. But if we haven't planned for this, you know, we're going to spend more time trying to, you know, deny and deliberate on what we should do. And, you know, on average, the active shooter scenarios, these things unfold and play out in six to 10 minutes. They're very, they don't last very long because of rapid response by law enforcement. So what we need individuals on the scene to do is quickly uh, take some sort of action. So by planning and preparing for this, it just makes our mindset ready to go uh, a lot quicker because, you know, it's one of those things I've heard you know, the, the body can't go where the mind's never been. So it's thinking about if I ever found myself in this situation, what would I do and respond quickly? Yeah, just to add what Jeff had said, uh, the big thing or big takeaway in planning is know the area, know your area, and what will I do if? And, and that could be an active threat. That could be weather-related. You know, what do I need to do? Uh, you need to identify the exits, like Jeff said. Uh, areas to hide, uh, not only at home, but at work, entertainment events. Uh, again, I hate to keep on falling back uh, on the law enforcement side, but when you did it 40 years, that's all you do. It's no different than what law enforcement do on a daily basis and they've been doing since the beginning of the law enforcement. Uh, we pay attention to where we're sitting in a restaurant. No, I don't want to sit there. I'm going to sit in this chair. Uh, so it's, you know, incidents can happen anywhere, anytime. 
and all that falls under the importance of prior planning. Uh, incidents are hard to predict and can happen, but the preparedness and a response plan in your mind will help you increase your survival. Uh, if you see something, say something. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to just go back and, and kind of add, if I can, um, you know, mentioning the, the denial, you know, that denial deliberation part that we want to hurry through to get to taking some sort of action. Uh, and I even think, you know, as, as Mark said, we've been in law enforcement a long time, and I was probably a good 25 years into my career. I started doing run, hide, fight training, uh, not to the extent that NCBRT does an eight-hour course. It was about an hour, hour and a half lecture on our camps. We'll talk about that probably in a few minutes. Um, but it was one of those where I had done that since 2007 after Virginia Tech. I was the only one on our campus that delivered it just to keep a, a concise message. Uh, and even one day I think of the situation where the, my chief was in the office, we were chatting about something, and all of a sudden I heard what I would describe as a muffled shotgun blast, just a loud noise that wasn't what you'd normally hear in the office environment. And the first response of the chief and I are talking, we hear this as we, we look at each other like, what was that sound? You know, then we hear it again. Well, of course, then we get up and go to investigate, and it was in the room behind me is uh, a large, uh, almost like a large uh, community sharing room where we could have videos, where we'd have meetings. Uh, and it's also where we have new officers when they come on the force. We do a lot of our defensive tactics uh, training in this room. So what it, what it was was this person, this new officer, is doing baton strikes, and I heard the batons, you know, slapping up against the big pad. Well, that was the sound I heard. But, you know, from that point on, I, I like to add that when I do presentations to talk about even somebody who's trained in law enforcement to prepare for something like this, to respond to this, who does training in regards to this, still my first reaction when I hear this sound with the chief is, what is it? We, I even go through, we all go through that phase. It's just a matter of how quickly can we progress to go into that decisive action state. And can you tell us, you mentioned uh, run, hide, fight training. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? The, tr the training not only brings out the survival techniques, uh, but most important, we discuss under what circumstances should you run, hide, and fight. No difference than in an airline. Uh, the flight attendant goes through the procedure, what you do on this case, what you do in this case, and then they leave and they expect you to react in case of emergency. The same thing we teach with training. We cannot be at that place. This is what you need to do. Uh, the Run, Hide, Fight program uh, also teaches you to bring back that training to the workplace so you can train as together on what you will do with coworkers. Uh, law enforcement cannot tell you every time if you're in this building, you will run out this door, you will hide here, or you will fight. Uh, that process needs to be prior to an incident. Uh, I have a, a information that... Uh, a person that I know was uh, at a location uh, where they had an active shooter and that person was there uh, a week before. So the active shooter actually came in and the co-workers called this person and said, I'm under this desk, now what, what do I do? Uh, so, it's, it's, it, so it's working, it works. Uh, we had an incident here on campus uh, where we ended up going in and, and information that it possibly was a person with a, a weapon and it took us two hours to clear because we had to find co-workers that it hid so it'll work but you have to prior plan and train you know and actually as far as you know is the training uh aspect of it when we, we're doing courses, if, if that's kind of what you're looking at as well or asking about. It varies. It, it depends upon the agency. It depends upon the city. It depends upon whoever's providing the training. We look at it, uh, NCBRT's training that we are both instructors for the Run, Hide, Fight course. That's actually an eight-hour class where we have uh, members come into the classroom. Basically, it's set up as a lecture-based morning uh, where we go through the response paradigm. We talk about how important planning is and the processes of that. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we actually give the class participants the opportunity to put the run, hide, fight paradigm to work. You know, the rubber meets the road at that point. We set up uh, activities in the afternoon where we'll bl fire blank guns to let people, you know, hear what would it sound like if a, a, a firearm was discharged in a building you're in. You know, we'll do it with doors open. We do it with doors closed. That way they can hear the difference. You know, is it even possible that a gun would go off in a building? 
and you not hear it, especially if it's a multi-story building, it's a very heavy built building, uh, there's a possibility that you, you won't hear that. Uh, so that's one of the trainings you know, LSU does with NCBRT. But when I did it on our campus, it was a one to one and a half hour lecture based uh, delivery. Again, just focused on the run, hide, fight paradigm. So it, it's really not as one better than the other. The main point is to get as much of this information out to as many people as possible. So hopefully we can uh, reduce the body count when these events occur. How do you successfully conduct outreach efforts on your campus to inform and train campus constituents about run, hide, fight? You know, what Jeff said uh, hit a big point uh, that this course is an eight hour course. Uh, we have the same thing with some uh, self-defense courses, but we have learned that you may not get this group for eight hours. So the training has been uh, an opportunity to just go in there for an hour, go in there 30 minutes. Anytime we can get in front of a group, we try to uh, to do that. Uh, student orientations, uh, the run, high fight video uh, that most universities have it on their website, uh, Greek chapter meetings, uh, social media, police outreach programs, uh, work with the building coordinators. We like to come in, train the group so everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and, and Bart hit the most, uh, you know, I mean, most universities are, are in the same, uh, you know, we all, we learn from each other, you know, so we, best practices, we all follow those. Uh, the only thing he did mention, I think of, we also, in our new faculty orientation comes in, I'm sure he does that, just uh, maybe not mentioned it. Uh, we also reach out to them as well as our new students. We have weekly uh, deans, directors, and department head uh, emails, newsletters that go out. Any way we can advertise the product we're providing, uh, or we provide it on our campus, we would do that. But a a lot of the outreach actually comes by word of mouth from those who have actually participated in the course. Uh, they may bring us back in because they, like everybody, uh, experience turnover. Uh, oftentimes throughout the year. So this isn't something that's a one and done. This is this information, the information doesn't change, but the people here you do. So we want to make sure we're able to get back into those uh, places. There were a, a number of, uh, on our campus, a number of departments that actually, once I did the run, hide, fight presentation, they even took it to the next step where they set up their own, you know, going back to the term, uh, terminology we used earlier, a lockdown drill. They were practicing their own, you know, uh, threat attack type scenario uh, where they would have the practice to the run, hide, fight paradigm on their own. Now, we would come in. Um, as you know, the bad guys, if you will, the police officers. Once uh, we presented, we'd come in just to just to moderate and monitor it. We didn't actually fire off blanks in our presentation. We just go. Now it was up to the department to set up how they're going to actually you know, pass out the, you know, do they put announcements out through a speaker system or they, do they do it through, via computer? Uh, and they would let their people know the week before saying, all right, we're going to have a drill sometime next week, but they wouldn't tell them when. So as the officers, as we'd show up, we'd kind of hide out to the side because we didn't want them if they saw the police coming and they knew that it was drill day. But we'd wait and, you know, they'd, they'd announce lockdown, you know, and active threat. And they you'd hear all the doors slamming. You'd hear light, your lights are going off, different things. And all of a sudden it got like the building was completely empty, which is the main focus. And with that we walk through the building then checking doors you know making sure people weren't standing where they could be seen kind of being the bad guy uh, and then we'd actually have a debrief afterwards an after action review um, and this actually uh, helped the departments then create better response to that because we may find shortcomings uh, during those drills but it also helped other departments see hey these departments are you know taking this on their own because as a police department with you know hundreds of colleges with thousands of students, with thousands of staff and faculty, uh, you know, it's really incumbent upon the, the departments to actually help us help them, you know, keep themselves safe. And that's one of the ways we did it on our campus. Uh, and, it, and that helped get the information out as well. Can you walk us through what a civilian should do right when they first get that text or email informing them of a threat? Well, my thought is, as Bart mentioned earlier, you know, there is no way for us to tell you this is what you need to do uh, because we don't know exactly where the threat is in relation to where you are right now. The main thing is understanding the paradigm and understanding you need to respond immediately. So once we get past that, it's really incumbent upon the person to say, okay, well, the threat uh, is across campus. You know, and if we're on a large campus, that can be two miles away, three miles away. Well, do we need to immediately lock the building down where we are, or lock ourselves in the office? You know, that may be the best option still, uh, but it also may be one of those where if the threat's that far away, you can simply go to your car and leave campus. That might be your best option. 
But if you hear gunfire and you're responding to that, that means the threat's much closer to you. Uh, and as I tell people, you know, a lot of times people, you hear that run, hide, fight, so they think they need to run first. And sometimes you'll hear, you know, get away. Well, that is that is the main point. You want to stay away from the threat. But, you know, if you look up and the threat's not where you are, before you just decide to run out of the location you are, there's a couple things to consider. Number one, how quickly can you run out of the building to evacuate or escape? Uh, and what are the chances when you try to do that, you actually run into that threat? Uh, and, and one of the you know points I made when I did my presentation was I would ask people, you're sitting in your office right now doing work, and all of a sudden you hear what sounds like gunshots. How long would it take you to reach down, grab your keys for the ladies out of their purse or out of their drawer, you know, get up out of their, and go get out of the building, go to their car? You know, and generally that's going to take you, you know, 50, 45 seconds to a minute, maybe a little bit longer, depending on where you are in the building. But I said, really, in a minute, if somebody is shooting going through a building, how much territory or ground can they cover in that same amount of time that they may be coming straight towards you? And then number two, realistically, what's going to happen is if you're working in your office, the first thing when you hear what sound like gunshots is it's kind of a deer in headlights response. You're going to go into that denial phase. You're going to deliberate for a few seconds, and we're burning that precious time. Ideally, you look up, the threat's not in front of you, you're probably in the safest place you need to be, and, and most likely you're hiding with a purpose as your best uh, option at that point. But mainly, it's realizing how close is the threat to me right now, and what are the best options available to me, and let me, do it, let me put those into play quickly. You know, like Jeff said, you know, I think we rely too much sometimes on the emergency text. Clearly requires that emergency text needs to be uh, issued and law enforcement and your campus authority will do that. There is a good chance that uh, when you get that text and you're in the building that's involved, running is not an option probably. Because uh, like Jeff said, you don't want to run out in the hall and wind up in front of the threat. Uh, so you, know, you need to identify uh, where the threat might be before you decide what options you're going to do. Uh, also, don't wait on the text. Like Jeff said, when you hear gunshots, uh, I've actually had people say, well, I never got the emergency text, so I didn't react. You hear something, you need to assess it and react. Uh, you know, with today with social media, probably 90% of the time, you'll get that social media hit before you get that text. Uh, because what law enforcement will do, they'll receive the information. At the same time, they're sending officers to the threat. They're also confirming what the threat is and then sending out a text. So don't wait on the text. React and have a plan. Uh, if you have disabilities, uh, if you feel like that running is not an option, fighting is not an option, then that be, needs to be put in your plan. Uh, I'm not able to run, so I will hide and I will hide here, or I will get my friend to help me. Uh, so again, that's that prior planning uh, to to be successful. And just to piggyback off of Bart again, uh, you know, what I recommend, we, we've talked about planning a number of times, Bart just mentioned again, and, and that is important because once we develop our own personal plan, and, and it's easier, you know, for people that are in the office setting, you spend most of your time, or the classroom setting for, for faculty or students, you know, generally you have five classes a day, you know, you understand the buildings those classes in, they, they don't change each day, they're always in the same building, the same location, uh, much like our office space. So really, that's where we want to kind of develop or design our own plan of action. If this were to happen and I'm in this room, how am I going to respond to that? And you may understand from that, this isn't a great place to hide because I have no locks on the doors. There's a lot of windows. I can't turn off the lights. I can't turn off sound making devices. So that's my best bet is to leave this room and find a different room that I can go into. But, you know, having that plan and developing that plan, but then take it one step further, you know, put that plan into action. And it could be just as I'm getting up to take my afternoon break, I'm going to lunch. I'm leaving for the day. You know, it's basically just walking through the steps on getting up, going, turning off the lights, locking the door. How long is that going to take? Because if it takes over 10, 15 seconds, you need a new plan uh, because it has to be a very quick response to uh, the threat. When I first came to LSU, uh, our senior administration building, uh, where the president of the university is and his staff and general counsel, uh, it's built where uh, they have large windows, but at the bottom, 
there's a window that can be opened and no one can figure what that is. Uh, obviously when that building was built, uh, we were not having the active threat uh, that we are now. Uh, but you know, when I first got there, I asked one of the senior administration, what is that window for? And, uh, and they said, I don't know, but that's my escape. Uh, and I don't know if they meant run, half fight, but they are looking at, yes, I'm going out that window if somebody comes in. So can we go through each part of run, hide, fight and tell us the considerations that a person should take when they choose one? You know, obviously the first one is run, uh, but to reiterate what Jeff and I have been saying, uh, that may not be first, but if we go through the training run, run away from the site as quickly as possible. Uh, find safety elsewhere to avoid the threat. Uh, the key benefit about running is to remove at-risk individuals from the scene entirely. Uh, distance is your goal. Getting away from the possibility of the threat is the top priority. Jeff mentioned, leave your belongings behind, get away. Uh, the quicker a person is able to identify the signs of the threat, the more option and time he or she has to take one of the options. Uh, we talked about preparing, uh, that includes escape plan. Uh, when you are safely in a location, call 911, don't pull the fire alarm. Why not pull the fire alarm? Because we all entrained that when you hear a fire alarm, you run out in the hall. Well, that may put you in harm's way. Uh, so again, you know, Jeff talked about at the beginning, uh, stop, rock, and roll. We won't run, hide, and fight to be the new uh, thing that pops in your brain if you think you're in a bad situation. Yeah, and, and one thing just to add uh, with the, the running, uh, you know, that's, uh, as Bart mentioned, you know, run as far as you can, as fast as you can. You know, and I tell people for as long as you can. And, and usually a lot of times when I did my presentations, I, you know, I told people there's a couple things. Number one, you know, the first thing I want to do is make it where our anxiety level for this course is low. We don't want to create more anxiety just teaching the class than, you know, than you already fear from an incident happening. Uh, so I try to, you know, make it as light as possible and add humor and those kind of things where I can. And, and one of the, the uh, parts I mentioned is when I talk about running, because oftentimes we watch a video uh, and we've seen Homeland Security, as I'm sure everybody's seen that video, where they do it, when they talk about the running, you know, the people are gathering people in the building, and as they exit, they kind of go out of the loading dock and then crouch behind uh, a dumpster area. You know, and, and obviously when you're, you're filming a video, they can't film it for the next 12 minutes while people run down the street and, you know, create three miles of distance. I understand that, but I, I let people know just when you watch that, it's really just telling you when you run, you want to, you know, get out of the building, get away. Uh, but I do, you know, kind of make light of it when I tell people run as far as you can, as fast as you can, for as long as you can. And when I tell our students in our faculty on camps and staff, you know, we were able to ride our RTS, our transit system in, in Gainesville for free. I said, at the point you can't run anymore, get your Gator One card out and jump on a bus and ride some more. You want to clear the area. You want to be as far away from this as possible. Uh, because number one, you're trying to escape a bad person with a, a firearm with bad intent, possibly. Uh, and now you've got more people with firearms coming in to deal with that. And that's law enforcement. So what you don't want to be is in between that situation. And also, if you decide to run, you know, take non-traditional, don't just take the straight line approach, you know, kind of, you know, move back and forth, making it a harder target if the person is trying to, you know, take shots as, as you're running. So just making sure we're not running in a straight line and consider that when it comes to running. Um, as far as hiding, I kind of touched on this a little bit before. You know, it's hiding with a purpose. We're not just crouching down behind the desk. You know, we may crouch down behind the desk to give ourselves some more cover and concealment within our, our space, but we want to make sure we're also arming ourselves, you know, with, you know, paper clips. Fire extinguishers are, are a great thing to have if we've got them in our building. Uh, anything that we can use to throw at the person to defend ourselves with uh, or kind of transition into that fight uh, mode. And if that is the case, uh, you know, I always like to say it, it's, Fighting should be the last option, but unfortunately, it may be the first step you have to take, depending upon where the threat uh, starts uh, in your location to that. Uh, but if you do, you want to fight with the intent to survive that incident. Uh, and again, identifying any kind of weapon that you can have in your workspace. And this is something, when I go back to that planning I was talking about a few minutes ago, you know, make sure, you know, do we already have things pre-staged within our office that we know if, if this were to happen, these are the items I'm going to use to defend myself uh, and try to uh, survive this incident. Yeah, you know, like Jeff said, you know, hide and 
a strategic location, uh, find a place to hide out of the view of the threat if that threat happens to be coming down the hall. Uh, try to pick a bulletproof hiding place. Bulletproof, what does that mean? Uh, bulletproof metal versus sheetrock uh, behind a file cabinet. Uh, you know, be sure to turn the, lock the door, block the door. Uh, put anything in there that will slow the threat in coming in that room. Because law enforcement, especially on a college campus, is minutes away. It's not 30 minutes, it's minutes away. So all you need to do is slow that person down for law enforcement to get there. Close the blinds, turn off the lights, turn your phones off. Uh, don't call your friends because they're going to call you back. Uh, again, remain there. We talked about earlier, remain there and, until law enforcement arrives. Uh, it may be 30 minutes, it may be an hour. Stay where you are. Uh, you know, fight. That is, you know, when we teach these classes, uh, I think the fight portion is when uh, people really get anxiety kicks in. And uh, it's nothing that law enforcement can tell you. It's you, and that's a decision that you have to think about prior to an incident. Uh, you, you're fighting to protect yourself uh, and use whatever is available. Uh, the desk, desk chair, uh, Jeff brought up uh, a fire extinguisher, scissors, hot coffee, anything uh, that will immobilize, disarm, or slow the defendant down. Uh, the big thing is if you are in a room with additional co-workers, and again, prior planning is, is talk about that ahead of time. Uh, as a group, if that threat makes entry into the room, the three of us are going to do A, B, and C. And, you know, it, it, I've, I brought this up before. Law enforcement can not tell you that. You have to decide, I'm not going to be a victim today. I'm going to take this person out or I'm going to try to take this person out. Uh, so that's the big thing on the fight. It's not, you're not stopping a, a robber from robbing a bank. You are surviving the attack and slowing that person down to keep them from harming you or others. Wrapping up today um, on our conversation about this paradigm, what are some key things that you would really want people to remember in the event that they're in an active threat situation, what would you want them to, what, you, what would be the first thing you want in their head when they are responding to this kind of thing? Uh, of course, so, you know, I'm thinking what I want in the head, run, hide, fight. Uh, but basically you're closing the gap uh, between the time an active, an active threat is discovered and reported to when the first responders arrive. So that gap, uh, you might be the help until help arrives. Uh, so have the plan, discuss it with coworkers. Uh, that's the, to me the big takeaway, especially if you're in a building uh, with coworkers. You know, studies say uh, that we spend more awake time uh, with coworkers than we do with our family, uh, especially during the work week. So get those people involved and determine who's going to do what, uh, secure, barricade, prepare to fight. Uh, you know, there's so much training out there. Uh, Jeff brought up NCBRT, the run, hide, fight, uh, self-defense programs, equalizers, RAD, rape, uh, aggression, defense. Uh, if you're on a college campus, you contact your local uh, security department or police department or your local law enforcement, I can promise you, uh, they will be more than willing and uh, to come in and discuss and help you prepare. And one thing uh, that we didn't uh, discuss earlier hasn't really come up, and, and it's probably one of the most difficult things that if this were actually to happen to do, but it's probably one of the most important things, stay as calm as possible, uh, because that's going to help you respond and react 
quicker uh, because you're, you know, you're, you're calm, cool, and collected. But it's also going to help if we get into that portion where we're hiding. You will want to keep people quiet because we're not wanting to draw the attention of the shooter. We want that area to seem as, as quiet or as, it, like it's empty. There's nothing in there. This person is going to continue to move on. So we want to try to stay as calm as possible uh, and then learn and, and practice the run-hide-fight paradigm. So it's your go-to action plan uh, when this happens. You go quickly from denial to decisive action almost immediately because we've already practiced this. I talked about it earlier, developing that plan of action for your space where you spend most of your day and practice, practice, practice. You know, develop this plan, practice as much as you can. And again, if it takes more than 10 to 15 seconds uh, to engage that plan, to get to an area where you can darken and secure it, you might need to consider a better plan. And then finally, uh, while the chance of ever being involved in an active threat situation is very remote, if you do, don't freeze. You want to do something run, hide, or fight. Thank you to Jeff and Bart for coming on the podcast to share their knowledge with us today. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.